we now return to the orientation concerning fact and fake, before that, if we look at um, what research is about, well, basically, lab research through early and late translation reaches the health service where the objective is to improve the outcome of patients. And the various names given to these different studies, for example, range from safety and tolerability, proof of concept, all the way to confirmatory and pragmatic trials. Now note that initial safety studies are carried out in healthy volunteers, but then patients are recruited. Uh, and these are the different names given in, in, the, in the drug regulatory vocabulary. And please note also that phase two in its later phase, phase three, and subsequently post-approval, uh, it is these trials that use randomization frequently before this aspect of exploratory or pilot trial, usually the studies are non-randomized. Now, why do we need randomized studies? Here is an example of breast cancer post Second World War, while the world is experiencing an economic, social and educational boom, the breast cancer rate in women continues to rise. During this time, studies, randomized studies, are being carried out. And only when, after several decades and recruitment of over 30,000 women in trials, it became possible to make a dent in the mortality associated with breast cancer. So it is with this view that we should see the problem of integrity. If trials lack integrity, they have no chance of making any impact on the outcome of patients. And that's uh, a disaster as far as uh, public and private investment in research is concerned. So returning back to what's a clinical trial, the phase two and three are the randomized versions. And the question is often asked, how many clinical trials can be trusted? And there isn't a ready or easy answer to this question. This is in part because determining what is an integrity flaw is not an easy task. But if we just look at retraction as a measure of integrity flaw, then you can see that it's a worldwide problem involving both developed and developing countries. And if we look at COVID-19 alone, there have been, from over 400 papers, around seven retracted randomized control trials. It's been established, for example, in Holland, that at least one in 12 people admit to having been involved in or having observed fabrication and falsification of research data within recent past in their active career. And a meta-analysis of the rate reported uh, combines results from around 18 studies, and it shows that people admit to data fabrication, falsification in themselves or in their work at around 2% rate, and having observed it in colleagues at around 14, 15% rate. This is obviously very concerning. Here you see that Pakistan also uh, is highlighted as one of the countries which has clinical studies uh, retracted. And here is an attempt to calculate the rate of retraction 
And the range of rate you can see varies from 20% to as low as uh, half a percent to 1%. Uh, it isn't for today to discuss why we have this problem in estimating the rate. But realistically, even if one trial is flawed, that is a looming danger for public health. So we cannot tolerate even a single flawed, integrity flawed randomized trials. Okay, now you may have noticed that I keep using the word integrity and I have not been using the word ethics. Let me explain uh, my own rationale behind this. Integrity covers two elements, one related to moral values and the ethics aspect falls under this uh, group of values. And then the second is professional standards as a researcher. And these standards uh, relate, for example, to data falsification and fabrication and plagiarism. So integrity refers to responsible research conduct and contains both elements, the ethical element and the professional element. So now if we look at a trial, it goes through designing, planning, approval, conduct, analysis, and then finally reporting. This is the life cycle of a trial. In this, we can have studies where there is clearly irresponsible conduct, either with respect to ethics or profession, professional standards. Or we have, by the book, responsible conduct, uh, again, with respect to both ethics and professional standards. And then there may be some gray zones in part because the ethics and professional standards themselves may not be clear on some aspect, uh, in which case, even when we seek advice from an expert committee, they may not be able to give a clear answer. Now, now let's look at what are the different types of errors that can occur. So. Look, all studies can be done better after they are completed. This means that, they, that all studies potentially harbor some errors. And these errors may be intentional, which are related to clearly irresponsible conduct. But quite a lot of errors may be entirely honest and unintentional. These unintentional errors may be related to lack of training. And uh, to reduce this type of unintentional error, the type of uh, workshop or course you are attending today is really important. And I applaud Professor Raza's effort to bring you all together to attend uh, this, these sessions where Hopefully, it will help reduce the possibility of unintentional errors in your trials in the future. Now, once a trial is published, it becomes part of the scientific record. And if everything has been done by the book, there are no integrity concerns in such a trial. But subsequent to publication, a complaint may be made to the journal. Complaint can also be made during the course of the trial. For example, a patient may complain that their consent was not properly obtained, in which case the institution where the trial is taking place has a responsibility to undertake an investigation. So concerns raised when investigated may lead to a conclusion that there is no case to answer or it may identify questionable research practices or research misconduct. 
in which case the paper may be retracted or retracted and republished or a correction may be issued associated with the main paper. And you can see that there is an area where nobody complains and nobody investigates. And perhaps integrity concerns go unchecked and unnoticed in the existing scientific record. This is where systematic reviews come in, where when they include trials, they have a responsibility to make an assessment of integrity of the included trials. <clears throat> So this is an overview of integrity incorporating both ethical concerns as well as deviations from professional standards in research. And when I talk about professional standards in research, in general, we are referring to what is called the GCP or good clinical practice 